yeah, you know, it gives students more opportunities and stuff like that. Yep. Well, I've got 906. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and start and we can use the recording. Sure. Or mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, I don't think I really need to introduce Russell to you. Uh, so just mentioned this, this project uh, kind of grew out of stuff that I worked on with a previous student, uh, Trevor. And Trevor had some ideas about the you know, like Spearman's growth and how it might work under picture models. We investigated a little bit. We didn't get very far. And so Russell took that over and uh, not only furthered the Spearman's growth part, but we did an equivalent investigation for Gangle South. We found a lot more relationship between them than we expected. And so all of that really came together pretty nicely, I think. And uh, I think I'll let Russell talk about it for 40 minutes now. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of that, there's actually something I didn't put into the presentation, but it's in my thesis. It's a general correlation coefficient, and it's a coefficient that relates Kendall's Powell, Spearman's Row, and actually Pearson's linear correlation coefficient. Okay, well, uh, Thank you for, thank you everyone for attending my defense. I'm gonna begin with a short speech. So I first wanna thank Dr. Garden for all his help on this project. Uh, over the past two years, we worked on this research and finished a paper pertaining to it. So hopefully we'll be publishing that soon, but who knows. I really enjoyed my time at this program and my entire Georgia Southern experience since I was also an undergraduate. Uh, this is due to professors like y'all. I uh, learned a lot of my classes, but you were also able to keep us interested and engaged. Uh, dare I say the classes were fun. Um, I really love graduate school and the saying goes, do what you love and, and you'll never work a day in your life. And well, none of this ever really felt like work. And we all know that you only learn as much as you allow yourself. And the main thing I learned is that I don't want to study Bayesian again. <laughs> Ch Chatterjee's not here for that one. <laughs> I learned that uh, no matter how good you get in programming R, Dr. Carden's probably already done it. <laughs> and I learned that no matter how many pandemics are in the world, Dr. Wanduku will always find a way to schedule a program or a conference. So, enough jokes. Thank you again. And I'm going to go ahead and begin the defense. That was a nice speech. <laughs> 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 so my project is on the bias of correlation under mixture models, okay, by me under the direction of Stephen Cardinal. Okay, so as an introduction, consider measuring the correlation between two variables, but the sample is contaminated with observations from an unintended population. So we're going to answer the following questions. So as the proportion of contamination P changes the mixing, how is this gonna bias the correlation? Uh, also, what form does the bias as a function of P, the mixing take? And can we characterize the behavior of the bias in some way? And do different measures of correlation behave in different ways? Uh, specifically, I'm gonna go into Kendall's Town and Spearman's Row. Okay, so first let's consider this example just as kind of a motivation for the uh, for the presentation. So a statistician collects data where some is valid and some is unwanted contaminating data. Uh, the two populations are bivariate normal distributions with the following parameters, uh, which we're all pretty familiar with here. Um, the first one, think of that as, as the valid distribution, centered at zero, um, and it has a weak negative correlation. Uh, and then the second one centered at two, three, it's got a strong negative correlation. Okay. So a simulation will give us a feel for the data. So here's kind of a diagram of a, just a sample from it. I uh, just noticed this would be the at first distribution and then that, that one up there with a the strong negative correlation is the second one. So I'm actually gonna finish this example in R. Let's go over to R. Okay. So let's look at this graph here. So this would be that first distribution I'm showing you guys. Centered at zero, zero. Let me increase the sample size a little bit. So now I'm gonna start mixing it with that other distribution. Uh, just to mention here, I got the least squares line just for kind of a visual aid. And then I have a correlation down here. 
Right now it's negative 0 0.42, so it's a weak negative. Okay. So as we start mixing. Mm -hmm. Also, can I? Yeah. So do you have to stop sharing and then you share this page? So that the right card. I think he's sharing just whatever's on the screen. I'm sharing on the screen. Oh, okay. Awesome. awesome. I think. All right. I, yeah. Okay. Um, so notice as I add a little mixing in, so just a, a few points from that other distribution, um, it's already, uh, the correlation has changed to positive. Uh, it's still weak. Um, and then as we add more and more mixing, uh, the correlation is now strongly positive. Uh, and just notice how the correlation was negative. It's now changed to positive. And as we add more and more mixing, more and more of the contaminating population, um, all the way up to almost sampling the entirely wrong population, the correlation is starting to go back to negative. Or eventually, if you sample the entirely wrong population, you get uh, you, you would get this, uh, where the correlation is now negative, strongly negative uh, for the second. Uh, so this is kind of an example of Simpson paradox, if you ever heard of that. Um, or if you look at the two groups separately, they both have a negative correlation, but if you combine them, it's positive. Uh, so just keep this example in mind as, I, uh, as we go through this. Okay, okay so here's the outline. I just did the introduction. I'm going to introduce mixture models, go into the different rate correlations, and then we're going to do the main research of this presentation, which is the bias of correlation under mixtures. And we're going to conclude. Okay, so what are mixture models? So mixture models can arise from sampling unwanted populations. So first, consider a statistician collecting GPAs from undergrads at Georgia Southern. But without vanity, some graduate students may enter the sample unintentionally. So when unwanted observations are introduced into the sample, you have a mixture of valid data and contaminated data. Uh, for example, if graduate students have higher GPAs, this is going to affect any statistics that you run on that sample. Okay, so more formally, this is how we're going to define a mixture model for this, for this project. Um, so let V be bivariate random vector and C be bivariate random vector representing the valid contaminating. And then let W be Bernoulli P, P between 0 and 1. Also let W be pairwise independent of the components V and C. Okay. I think I already said this, but think of this as the valid, think of this as the contaminated. Okay. Then we define the mixture of V and C as a random vector M as 1 minus WV plus WC. Okay. So depending on the mixing proportion, P, uh, you'll either get a contaminating or a valid. Okay. okay, so that's the mixture model. Now let's talk about concordant and discordant pairs. Okay. A concordant pair occurs when there's two points, X1, Y1, and X2, Y2, that have the same signs when the components are subtracted. Okay. In other words, uh, we have this expression here. And then a discordant pair occurs when the opposite is true or when they have opposite signs. Okay, so if you just put a negative in there, it's a discordant pair. Okay, so graphically, this is what we have. So concordant pair, we have an increasing, just means they're increasing pair, and then discordant, we decrease Okay, now let's get into the rank correlation method. First one we talk about is Kendall's Tau. So um, this is the sample definition of Kendall's Tau. Some of you have probably seen this before. Uh, so given a sample of raw data, x1, y1, up to xn, yn, first calculate the number of concordant pairs, and then number of discordant pairs, and then it's defined as c minus d over c plus d. Or another way to write it is c minus d over n choose 2, where n is the sample size. Okay. Kenneth's style has a range from negative 1 to 1, where each extreme is perfect correlation of each sign. Uh, and in fact, Kendall style can capture any type of monotone behavior. Okay, so we'll see that here. So just notice um, this example on the left, it's strictly increasing. Um, so we're not measuring linear correlation uh, like, like traditionally would. 
uh, but it's strictly increasing, so tau is one. Same with the second example, uh, strictly increasing, tau is one. And then just an example of uh, kind of jumping up and down, it's uh, strongly negative. Okay, so this is how this is how you calculate chemical style, uh, just for an example. Uh, so if we have these points here, this would be a plot of them. First thing you do is you sort them by the x's. So they just have to be one, two, three, four. Um, let's uh, sort them by the x's, decreasing to increasing, and then count the number of concordant and discordant pairs. So starting here, from negative one to five, we got increasing, increasing. Is it nine? Nine. nine. That's okay. So increasing negative one to five, negative one to seven, increasing, negative one to six, increasing. Then we jump to five, increasing, increasing, and then the last pair decreasing. So we get five concordant, one discordant, tau is two thirds. Okay. Now we're going to introduce the population definition, which a lot of you probably haven't seen before. So as motivation, consider this expression here as the sample size increases. Um, so think of the sample definition. As we increase the sample size, split these two terms up, kind of think of this term as approaching a probability of concordance, and this one approaching probability of discordance. So more formally, the population version, uh, consider a bivariate distribution with random pair x, y, let x1, y1, x, uh, x2, y2 be independent and identically distributed IID pairs. And then Kendall's tau of population is defined as, as this expression here, uh, which is pretty intuitive. Uh, x1 minus x2, y1 minus y2, if these have the same sign, then they're positive, right? Same here, if, if uh, these two are have, the, have different signs, it'll be negative. Okay? We have this probability of concordance minus probability of discordance. Okay, so Kendall style, let's talk about experiments row. Okay, so this is the sample definition. So let x1, y1, up to x and y n be real value observations. And then let rx and ry be the ranks of each respective uh, variable. Okay, so, and then this is how we define experiments row of a sample. It's the covariance of the ranks divided by the standard deviation of the ranks of x divided by the standard deviation of ranks of y. Uh, now this expression uh, may look familiar. Uh, well, it looks like Pearson's correlation, right? So this is just the definition of covariance and then this is the definition of standard deviation. So it's similar to tau where they can both capture general monotone behavior. Rho also has a range negative one to one. Um, and yeah, like I was saying, just observe that Spearman's rho is actually just Pearson's with the rank. Uh, so here's the same examples that we saw earlier. Perfect monotone behavior. Rho is one, strictly increasing one. Uh, and then the same thing here, strongly negative. Okay, so this is how you would calculate Spearman's rho. On those uh, the same points that we had earlier, you got the ranks, ranks of y, uh, and you can just just throw it in R covariance and then the standard deviation, 0.8. Uh, just something to mention: Spearman's row. Uh, if you remember, tau is two thirds. This is 0 0.8. It's usually the case that Spearman's row is, is a higher in magnitude than Kendall's tau. Okay, so. Kind of how we, we tied together the sample definition and the population definition for tau. Uh, it's not so easily connected intuitively or briefly. So we're going to skip that and we're going to come back to that uh, later on. So in the meantime, this is the population definition. So consider a bivariate distribution, random pair x, y. Um, let x1, y1, up to x3, y3 be IID pairs. Um, so Spearman's row of a population is defined as this quantity here. Okay, so it looks similar to tau. 
Uh, the difference is we have the scalar three out in front, but we also have this extra extra pair here. We have this extra component of independence. So we not only have independence between X1 and X2, but also they'd be independent of this third component too. Um, and that's something we'll, we'll see pop up later on. Uh, we'll see that extra independent component uh, play a role in some of the other definitions. Okay, so now let's talk about cofields. So, so far we've seen the sample version, population version of the down row. Um, so along with the population definitions, there's equivalent definitions in terms of copulas. Okay? So copulas are important tools as they're able to isolate information about the dependent structure of jointly distributed random variables. Okay. Kind of a mouthful and copulas, uh, they're not easy to learn, but they're, they're really important. So for the purposes of this project, we're only going to do a bivariate case but calculus, they can be extended to d-dimensional case. Okay, so this is the definition of a copula. Okay. A two-dimensional copula is a function, we'll call it C, from the unit square to the unit interval with bivariate inputs, such that the following conditions are satisfied. So firstly, C is a two-increasing function. Uh, you can kind of think of this as like, a univariate, like what a non-decreasing function is, it's kind of the, the analog to that for, for bivariate. Okay, equivalently, it's got to satisfy this condition as well. And this a lot of times is also called quasi-monotone. So, and it also has to satisfy, satisfy these conditions as well. So kind of looks similar to maybe like a CDF. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce Sklar's theorem. So Sklar's theorem uh, states that any bivariate joint distribution can be written in terms of univariate marginals and a copula, which describes the dependent structure between the variables. Okay. So just for notation, let f x y be a bi bivariate CDF with marginals f x f y. Sklar states that there exists a copula C such that for all X, Y, the copula evaluated at the two marginals gives us the CDF. Okay. So it kind of uh, takes the two marginals and uh, glues them together and gives us the dependence part of the CDF. Okay. Um, then there's some other conditions here. Uh, but this is the main this is the main idea. Okay. Okay. So Sklar's corollary. So using the same notation as in Sklar's, um, also let f x inverse and f y inverse be quasi inverses of f x f y respectively. Then for any u v in the domain of C, we can write the copula as the C D F evaluated at the inverses or quasi inverses of X and Y. Okay. Uh, another thing to mention, copulas have uniform marginal distributions, zero one. Thank you. Okay. So we have this thing called the independence copula. Um, and this is what it is. We, we denote it as capital Pi here. Um, so if two random variables are independent, or let me read this statement. In fact, random variables are independent if and only if their copula is the independence copula. Um, so, right, so if you have two random variables, um, like I was saying earlier, copulas have uniform marginal distribution zero to one. Um, so it would make sense that the independence copula, if they're independent, it's just the multiplication of u and v. Okay. So, so, the, so the pi is the copula, right? It's the copula. Okay. So think of it as c, as the c copula, it's just uh, a special notation. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So now, 
we're going to introduce the Q construct. Okay. So the Q construct is going to relate the probability of concordance and discordance into copulas. Okay. So very notation heavy on this down. Um, but just a few things I want to point out here. So F1 is the first CDF here for these uh, pairs. F2 is the other CDF and each have respective copulas. So think of copula one as a copula for the first distribution, copula two. Letting Q equal the probability of concordance minus probability of discordance, then we can define Q in this way. So Q evaluated at the two copulas is equal to this expression here. Okay, so it's four times the double integral uh, over the unit square of the second copula integrated with respect to the first copula, minus one. Okay. So here's a corollary to that. So using the same notation, uh, we're going to let C bar, that's a survival copula. A survival copula has the same properties as a typical survival function. Uh, so that Q, Q thing we saw on the last slide, so it's symmetric in this argument. So you can switch the, the two arguments and it's, it's equivalent. Maybe as a reminder, what's a typical survival function? Um, so if you have like, a, if you have a CDF and you find a survival function, all those properties, uh, pretty much, uh, you can think of C bar as like being the analog to a survival function. Okay, but how is survival function defined? For univariate, a survival function is one minus a CDF. For a bivariate, uh, there's a longer definition. It's one minus the um, first marginal distribution minus the second marginal distribution plus the joint distribution. Okay, but it's intuitively, what does it capture? Like if the CDF is less than or equal to probabilities. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so yeah, it it captures the probability above a certain value. Okay. okay. So using the Q notation, we're now going to define an equivalent definition of tau. So so far we've seen the sample definition, the population definition, in terms of probabilities. Um, so now we're going to introduce this. So let x y be a continuous random vector. And let C be a copula for XY. Kendall's tau can be defined as QCC. Okay, so the same copula as four double integral over the unit square of that copula integrated with respect to that same copula minus one. Okay, and you may be looking at this um, like how, how do you integrate? with respect to another function. Um, we'll, we'll get into that. Okay. okay, and then here's the equivalent definition of row. Okay, so let xy be a continuous random vector and let c be a copula for xy. Spearman's row is defined as three times q of c pi, the independent copula. Um, and this independence copula uh, is here for a reason. It pops up because of that extra independence we had in the population mechanism. So it's 12 times the double integral over the unit square of the copula integrated with respect to u and v minus three. Okay. So now we're gonna to tie together the, the sample definition of rho and uh, the population definition. So. Take a look at this. Um, so this is the quantity we just defined here. So if you guys remember the uh, uh, sample definition of, of rho, uh, Spearman's rho is Pearson's of the ranks, right? Okay, so let's begin here. So q, uh, three times Q, this is the quantity we defined here. From this step to this step, we're gonna apply Sklar's corollary. Uh, and then we're going to write it in terms of probability notation. And then from this step to this step, um, we're just making uh, a change of variables. 
And then we're assuming that the copula is differentiable. So we can write this as the density with respect to u and v. This quantity here, this integral, is it just the expected value of u and v? And then we're going to bring the 12 in the denominator, turn this into expected value of uv minus 1 fourth over 1 12. And because copulas have uniform marginal 0, 1, um, they each have expected value of 1 half. So this uh, 1 fourth here, you can think of it as 1 half times 1 half, or expected value of u, expected value of v. Well, that's just the covariance of u and v. And the variance of a uniform 0, 1 is 1 12. So that's where we get this uh, variance of u, uh, square root, square root of variance of v, okay. which is Pearson's. Okay. Okay. Now we've kind of related the sample definition and the population definition. It's not as obvious with Rho as it was for Tau. Okay, so just a quick recap. So we've seen the copula definitions for Rho and Tau and the, in terms of probabilities. So there's a last one that we're gonna use. So let XY be continuous random vector, joint CDF, FXY, marginals, FX, FY. We can also define Tau as this quantity. Yeah. So it kind of looks similar to that copula definition. Well, it's not that hard to get from the copula definition of this one. It's just, uh, you're just invoking Sklar's theorem. Okay, and we can also define Spearman's row as this quantity here, which is 12 times the double integral. I uh, just notice here we have the joint CDF with respect to the two marginals, minus three. Okay. Okay, so that last definition is what we're going to use in, in this theorem here. So now we're going to introduce the bias under mixtures. Okay. So letting V, C, M, W, and P be the same as we described in the mixture model definition. The bias under the mixture is defined as, so the bias of tau as a function of P is tau of the mixture minus tau of the valid. Okay, and then the bias of rho as a function of p is rho of the mixture minus rho of the valid. Okay. So using this idea, we're now going to introduce the main result here. Can I ask you to clarify one thing? Yes. So you've got the bias as a function of p, and then you don't see p on the right-hand side of that. So where is it? So we're going to write uh, tau of the mixture if you remember the mixture is a function of P, so it's going to be in there. And it's implied inside of P. Yeah. Okay, so here's a quick lemma that we'll need before we actually get into this. So um, letting FXY be a joint CDF, marginal is FXFY, with survival function S, um, these are equivalent statements here. So if we take an integral of a joint, the CDF with respect to two, mar uh, yeah, two marginals, we can replace those with survival functions. And similarly, you have a joint CDF with respect to joint CDF, you can replace them with survival. Okay. Yeah, well, most of these lemmas and, and theorems, uh, there's, there's proofs in, in my actual thesis. Okay, so this is the, this is the main result here from the research. So the following theorem will present this idea of bias in terms of the mixing proportion P. Okay. Uh, and just something to note, if there's, there is no mixing, then the bias is zero because tau of the mixture is just tau valid. And you get tau valid minus tau valid is zero. Okay, so the bias in Kendall's tau and Spearman's row due to mixing can be expressed as these expressions. Uh, we have bias of T as a function of P is four times a quadratic okay, with these two coefficients here. And the bias of rho, the function of p, 12 times a cubic with three coefficients. Okay, now, now let's get into the coefficients. Okay. So these are the first two coefficients for tau. This is a and b. Um, and at, at first glance, 
uh, definitely overwhelming. Um, but there's a lot of structure here uh, that we can that we can take advantage of. So, well, all of them are double integrals with of a survival with respect to another survival. Um, really, survival of the valid, survival of the contaminating. They're just different combinations of that. Yeah. So that's something we'll be able to use when we go to evaluate them. Uh, so the coefficients for rho uh, as a part of that cubic, we have A and B and C here. Uh, similar uh, idea here where we have, we have some structure in these integrals, although they're definitely messy. Um, they're all double integrals of a survival function with respect to two other survival functions, just different combinations of them. So. And same here. Okay, so we're not going to do the proof, but the important, the important step involves taking advantage of the linearity of integral differentials. Okay, so what, what does that mean? So this is the property that we use. Uh, so uh, this lemma here, so letting f, fx, g, and h be real value functions, a, b, and c just be scalars, then this following property is true. So you have an integral of a function with respect to some linear combination of other functions uh, with scalars, or you can distribute those, which is what you, we use. Okay. So the A comes out and we have FX, D, DX, uh, just distributing them. Okay. okay. Now, originally we wanted to be able to characterize the bias in some way. So that's what we're doing here when we come up with these different cases. So consider a quadratic function without a constant term, which is what we have for tau. Uh, then the following inequality is on the next slide. Between A and B serve as a partition of the coefficient space that characterizes the root behavior and thus the region of the unit interval where the function is positive and negative. Okay. okay, so here are all the different cases we have uh, for A and B that characterizes uh, how the bias can become positive and negative. Uh, more importantly, let's look at graphs. Okay, so just notice here we have the bias would always be positive, always positive, always negative, always negative, and then going from positive to negative, negative to positive. And always starting at zero because there's a constant term. Okay. And we'll do the same thing for a cubic function. Which uh, shout out to Dr. Carden, he did most of that. Get him and Trevor on the previous. Um, so consider a cubic function without a constant term, uh, which is the form of the bias of rho. Uh, then the following inequalities for a, b, and c serve as the partition the coefficient space that characterizes the root behavior and thus the regions in the unit interval where the function is positive and negative. The same thing here. Um, a lot of different cases for, for a cubic. Uh, but again, more importantly, let's look at the, the graphics here. Uh, we have cases where it's always positive, always negative, positive to negative, negative to positive. And then because it's a cubic, we also have positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. Um, now this one here kind of a uh, Kind of familiar when I first uh, when we first did the example at the beginning. Um, this is kind of what happened. So we had uh, you guys remember the correlation started negative, and then as we added mixing, became positive, and eventually um, came back to negative at the end. So this would be kind of an example of that. Okay. So. With that being said, let's now do an example. We're going to use the marshall olken distribution. And this arises from shock models and its ability to predict the failing of two, a two-component system. Okay? So think of a machine, it's got, it's got two parts. Um, now we're going to let, we're going to define three independent random variables, Z1 through Z3, 
all exponential with respective parameters lambda. Okay, these represent the occurrences of the shocks. So Z1 is going to be a shock to the first component. Z2 will be a shock to the second component. Z3 is a shock to both. Okay. And then lastly, we're going to define these two random variables, X and Y. X is the min of Z1 and Z3. This will represent the lifetime of the first component. And Y is going to represent the lifetime of the second component because it'll fail if either is a shock to the first or a shock to both and similar for Y. Okay, so first thing we did was find the joint survival function because that's what we, uh, that's what the bias is in terms of. Um, so the, the survival function will make future calculations more efficient while still arriving at the same result. Okay, so here's the expression. Um, and just something to point out is that that max term there. So the max term um, caused some problems, but it's something we'll be able to work with. Okay, so here's a visualization of the marginal all condition. Um, so these two have the same parameters. The blue has the same parameters, and the black has the same parameters. Uh, we have a survival function at the top, CDFs. Um, so it's definitely more pronounced in the last graphic, um, but there's a there's a definite uh, line that you can see there, which is a cusp. It's a sharp point, a non-differentiable point, which is something we'll we got to deal with. Okay. So back to R. So we. Uh, So we found the copula for the marginal open distribution. And I'm gonna go ahead and plot that. Okay, so this is the, uh, these are different uh, UV values for the marginal open copula, depending on the lambda values. So the reason I wanted to show you all this is this uh, very dense line here. Uh, and that's caused from that max term. Okay. So without um, taking, so we, we need to take this into account. Otherwise, if we integrate it, we're going to lose a lot of density if we don't. Can I point something out on that before you go ahead? Yeah. You joked at the beginning that anything you do in R, I've already done. Yeah. I have not seen this before. I learned this from you. So the, uh, that's a really cool library that you have. So doing the, the slide thing? Yeah. 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 What's, that, what's that library? It's called Manipulate. It allows you to like, uh, if you have a plot or a graphic or something. Uh, so you can change all, all the arguments you have. Any, in any parameter, yeah. I'm learning stuff from YouTube. <laughs> it's good. That's about it, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to the bias. So using the definition of bias that we defined earlier in the theorem, uh, we can find the bias for both tau and rho under the Marshall open distribution in terms of the mixing proportion P. Okay, so we're gonna start with tau. So again, to save a lot of time and calculations, we can notice that each of those intervals follows a similar form. Uh, therefore, by solving the integral with... Sorry. I think that... Okay. I thought that was my phone. <laughs> um, okay, so let's begin with tau. So to save a lot of time and calculations, uh, we can notice that each integral follows a similar form. Uh, therefore, we're going to solve an integral with placeholder parameters. Um, then the actual integrals just need parameters plugged into the correct spots for, for each of the integrals. So to do this, we're going to solve any of the integrals with parameters alpha and beta, one to three, um, because Marshall Open has three parameters, or the, the way we define it has three parameters, is that lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. Okay, and one more lemma that we need to, to introduce before we uh, evaluate tau. 
So Lee's, Lee's Cogula theorem is going to allow us to evaluate that non-differentiability cusp that I was showing. Okay. And this is the theorem. So let fxy, gxy be joint distribution functions. Then this integral, so integral of f, fxy with respect to gxy is equal to one half minus the double integral of fxy uh, partial derivative with respect to x, gxy partial derivative with respect to y, and then integrated with respect to x and y. So we're going to invoke that when we go to tau. Okay. So this is what we did. So if you notice that first, that integral at the top there looks just like the, the integrals that we saw in the, the bias definition. Um, we're just using alpha and beta as the parameters. Okay. So using Lee's, Lee's lemma here. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention something. So this is Lee's copula theorem for CDFs. So originally, it, this was a, a theorem for copulas, but we're using an extension uh, for CDFs, in this case, survival functions. Okay, so we solve this integral, we get this expression here. Okay, so now if we want to evaluate it, since we have both a valid distribution and contaminated distribution, let's go ahead and define these parameters. So think of this as distribution of the valid, distribution of contaminated. So let's pick one of the integrals. So I picked this one, so integral of SV with respect to SC. This is the alpha spot, or this would be the alpha survival function. This would be the beta survival function. So anywhere we had an alpha, we're going to plug in the valid parameters. Anywhere we had beta, we're going to plug in the contaminating parameters. So that's what we did. And you can imagine, like, uh, to make it a lot easier, you can make like a function in R that can easily just plug, plug them all in once you have this final expression. Or you can do what we did and just Type them all out by hand. <laughs> okay, so these are simulated parameters for tau for each case. So all those cases that we saw earlier, uh, we simulated parameters, we randomly generated parameters until they met each case, okay? And they all work. I um, mean, these parameters are the, the actual values we used to produce the figures that we saw earlier. So here are the figures again. Okay, now for rho. So similar to tau, we're going to solve a general integral to ease calculations. Uh, so rho general integral will involve three general parameters because uh, there's two differentials. Okay, there's two survival functions in the differentials. So we're going to have three general parameters. So alpha, beta, and gamma this time. One to three. Okay, so now onto the general integral of rho. So now we have double integral of survival alpha with respect to survival beta with respect to survival gamma. So solving that expression, uh, we get this expression here with alpha, beta, and gamma in it. Okay, so same thing with tau. Uh, for instance, if we want to solve this integral, we have the alpha survival function, the beta, and the gamma. We just have to plug the valid parameters where we everywhere we saw alpha, contaminating parameters everywhere we saw beta, valid parameters everywhere we saw gamma. And we can do that for each uh, 50 integral, whatever it was. Okay, so these are simulated parameters for rho for each case. So we were able to find uh, parameters for every case. Okay, so these are the same figures that we saw earlier. Um, as we got to the, the later cases, uh, it was definitely harder to generate them. It took a lot more time. Um, but point is, we, we did eventually find cases for each. And maybe you point out, in those yeah. last six and seven, which were very difficult to find, mm -hmm. look at the magnitude of the bias on those. That's true. Yeah, so these, the scale, I mean, it's very small. Yeah. 
Okay, so in conclusion, so what questions have we answered here? So bias is introduced into models depending on a proportion of mixing. And we can characterize the bias for chemical style under a mixture model as a quadratic with respect to the mixing proportion. Uh, we can characterize the bias for Spearman's row under a mixture model as a cubic with respect to the mixing proportion. And we saw that every case is feasibly possible. Uh, some may be more common than others. Okay, so maybe what questions have, have we not answered? So there is potential to represent these calculations in terms of copulins, um, which is something you'll see in my thesis if you read it. Um, I defined tau and rho for Marshall Oaken in terms of copulins. Um, one thing that didn't work out is uh, we tried to find a the copula of the mixture for Marshall Oaken and it ended up uh, we couldn't find a closed form expression for that. Okay. And then there's also other association measures that we can, can be considered. Uh, for instance, Cronbach alpha. That was analyzed in a previous paper by Dr. Cardin, Trevor, and Nick Holtzman. Okay. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. I guess I'll open it up for questions now. First, we'll give the uh, non committee audience this is a chance to <clears throat> ask questions if they have any. Okay. I guess just more of a clarification, yeah. just from my knowledge of this. The mixture model, it doesn't matter how much of the data is contaminated, like all of, everything you applied will work, kind of like what you showed in R. So if you had it where like the mixture model became very prevalent and very small, mm -hmm. either way, like this will still accurately measure the true correlations. Well, as in like statistics in general, I, the bigger your sample size is, mm -hmm. the more accurate you'll be. Right. Um, but that, that's a good question because we actually, I, I did that part, that was like a sample, but everything we did beyond that, we actually worked with populations. Okay. So the expression we found at the end was actually like the exact analytical solution. Oh, I got you. Okay. Anything else? All right. All right. If there's not, then uh, I think you can, you can stop the recording and stop the Zoom call. Okay. And we'll ask the uh, student members of the audience to leave and we will we'll ask questions. Okay, well, uh, I'm ending the recording and the Zoom call too. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Would you want to come yeah, online? Thank, thank you. you. Thank thank you. And they can share the news. What, what do you think, Russell? Do you want to? Uh, you want to actually leave the call open and maybe just mute it, and then, you know, assuming that you pass, you can give them the news then. Yeah. I think I and okay. maybe your mom is listening on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you make a call. That's okay. I'll, I'll end it. <laughs>